The next item of business is members' business debate on motion 15230 in the name of Willie Coffey on congratulations to Kilmarnock Football Club on its 150th anniversary. And this debate will be concluded without questions being put. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Willie Coffey to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Thanks very much, Presiding Officer. And can I thank MSPs who have signed uh, the motion? I think there's about 29 at the last count. If you're making a contribution, it would be lovely to hear what club you support in Scotland. It adds to the rich colour of the debate today. Uh, Presiding Officer, it's with great pleasure and a great deal of pride that I'm able to propose this motion in the Scottish Parliament in 2019 to commemorate and celebrate the 150th anniversary of my beloved Kilmarnock Football Club. I'm fortunate to still have in my possession the wonderful book, Go Fame, written for the club's centenary in 1969 by the leading sports author of that day, Hugh Taylor, and I hope to share one or two extracts from it today. As a native of Old Kelly and living there all my life, I'm lucky to have also seen the club's 100th and 125th anniversaries. There is something really special when these landmark anniversaries arrive and they bring the club and the people of the town and wider district ever closer together. And that is so much in evidence already this year. So how did it all begin for Kilmarnock? We know there were young men in the town in the mid 1860s playing cricket and looking for a winter sport to keep themselves amused basically. This new sport with the debate about whether it should be played with the hands or no hands had actually been raging since the 1820s. Eventually, these cricketers joined with the boys from Kilmarnock Academy and adopted this kicking game. What was actually played around the 1860s couldn't have passed for either football or rugby. Their intention seemed to be to have a good time socially and for those early pioneers, that was all that mattered. The first recorded general meeting called on interested parties who wanted to become members of the Kilmarnock Football Club appeared in the Kilmarnock Standard on Saturday the 2nd of January. And that historic meeting took place three days later in Robertson's Temperance Hotel in the town on Tuesday, 5th of January, 1869, notified by a young 19-year-old John Wallace, who became the club's first secretary, then president. And so it had begun. Kilmarnock Football Club was officially born. In those wonderful early days, because the rules were, let's say, evolving, and protests were commonplace about the outcome of a game. In one game, the New Ayrshire Association had to remind teams that they couldn't pick their own referee, nor should the referee appear as a 12th man for that team. <laughs> Some might argue, presiding officer, that little has changed since then. <laughs> As early as 1873, Kilmarnock became one of the eight founding members of the SFA, along with, and along with Queen's Park, Dumbarton, and another 13 clubs, put up the money for the first Scottish Cup. Kelly played in what is thought to have been the first ever Scottish Cup match, sadly losing 2-0 to Renton. Interestingly, Renton claimed to be the first world club champions when, as Scottish Cup winners in 1888, they challenged and beat West Bromwich Albion, who had won the English FA Cup. Scottish players were much sought after by their English counterparts, and the drive to professionalism, still illegal but largely ignored in Scotland, was resisted by Queen's Park, who were supported in this by Kilmarnock. But eventually, Kilmarnock became a professional club in 1894 and joined the Scottish Second Division a year later. That early support to retain amateur status had cost Kelly and it took until 1899 before they were voted into the first division. Steady, if not spectacular, progress followed, and the club's first major trophy was in 1920, with a 3-2 win over Albion Rovers in the Scottish Cup final at Hamden in front of 95,000 fans. One of the players in the squad, uh, Sandy Higgins, lost his father. Yes, I will, yeah. Fulton McGregor. Uh, Mr McGregor, your microphone's oh, not on. Sorry. Ah, there you go. I was looking for an appropriate time to get an intervention in, and the, the mention of Albion Rovers allows me to do that. Um, Albion Rovers uh, have got a rich history in the game as well. 1882, that they've been, um, they, they were founded, and this is their 100th year playing in, the, playing in the professional league. I wonder if the member will agree with me 
that, that clubs like Albion Rovers, uh, who offer so much to the local communities, um, uh, uh, play such an important role in Scottish life. Uh, is there anybody else would like to chip in something about their local team before, <laughs> before Mr Coffey proceeds? <laughs> Willie Coffey. Ab absolutely, President Officer. I congratulate Albion Rovers and all the community-based uh, Scottish football clubs. Uh, they're usually very well run and in many cases better run than some of their bigger counterparts. Um, I was just about to say, though, on that, that fateful day, one of the players in the Kilmarnock squad, Sandy Higgins, he lost his father in the day of the final. Sandy Senior was one of the great early players and was the first commander player to play for Scotland. Now, a similar tragedy was to hit our club many years later, presiding officer in 2012, which I'll come to in a moment. A second cup final victory was celebrated just a few years later in 1929, when Kilmarnock beat the cup holders and league champions Rangers 2-0. Interestingly, one of the Kilmarnock heroes that day was our goalkeeper, Sam Clemmie, who made save after save and even saved a penalty to keep Kelly in the game. At the celebrations later that night, Big Sam was asked to make a speech, but told the audience he couldn't make speeches, but he could save penalties. To a tumultuous roar from the fans. I was lucky enough to see Sam Clemmie's medal from that day some years ago with my brother Danny and my dad, and I always fondly remember that too. For me, presiding officer, as a young boy, the 1960s Kilmarnock team under manager Willie Waddle was a dream. Our first European match was against Eintracht Frankfurt in 1964, and despite losing 3-0 in Germany and losing an early goal at Rugby Park to make it 4-0 for the Germans, Kelly went on to score five goals in what was one of the most incredible comebacks in European football. That same season, Kilmarnock and Hearts were fighting it out at the top of the league, and on the last day of the season, 24th of April 1965, we won the championship. Kelly had to beat Hearts at Tynecastle by two goals or more to win on goal average. And they did just that. Yes, Bruce? Would you remind Bruce Crawford. Uh, would you remind the Chamber who were in third place on that occasion? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Willie Coffey. It was Dunfermline, presiding officer. <laughs> <laughs> Come on up, players. Davis Sneddon and Brian McElroy scored those vital goals and a sensational save by Bobby Ferguson in the last few minutes prevented Hearts from grabbing the title at the end, even in defeat. I remember the key moments as though they were yesterday, even although I was only six years old and my brother Danny was 10. My dad's response to my worried mother about taking us to such a big game was, they're going, they might not see it again. He's been right so far, well, up until this season, that is. Real Madrid then breezed into Rugby Park later that year in the European Cup and were lucky to escape with a 2-2 draw. And shortly after, in 1967, Kilmarnock played the magnificent Leeds United team in the semi-final of what is now the Europa League, a stunning period of achievement for the club. It's fair to say that an unspectacular period followed after this, but in 1997, glory returned again, presiding officer, with another Scottish Cup victory at Ibrox on 24th of May with a 1-0 win against an excellent Falkirk team. To complete that trilogy of Scottish trophies, we had to wait until 2012 to lift the League Cup for the first time, beating Celtic 1-0 at Hamden. That joy and elation soon turned to despair, though, when the news emerged that Kilmarnock player Liam Kelly's dad had collapsed at the game and later died, echoing the very sad and similar circumstances of 1920. Presiding officer, this famous old football club has made a huge contribution to Scottish football and is still going strong. We have some famous people supporting us, from Marie Osmond, whose 70s hit Paper Roses is the club anthem, <laughs> to Biffy Clyro, who are regular visitors to Rugby Park. And of course, we have the award-winning Kilmarnock Pie and Kelly Pie, keeping our fans and visitors happy at Rugby Park. We enjoy a healthy battle for supremacy now with the second team in Ayrshire, Hockey like Talbot. <laughs> and, we, and we are currently enjoying an amazing period under the magnificent Stevie Clark, with Kelly ending up with point, most points in the SPFL season in 2018. So to all the talented players and managers, past and present, to the wonderful club officials and staff across the years, and to the incredible supporters of this famous old football club, congratulations, Kelly on your 150th anniversary. May you enjoy many more successful years ahead. And to Kelly fans the world over, let's never forget 
that we are Kelly till we die. Thank you. We move to the open debate. Um, speeches of four minutes, please. Brian Whittle, followed by Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I first congratulate uh, Willie Coffey for uh, securing time in the Chamber uh, to debate and to celebrate uh, 150 years of Kilmarnock uh, Football Club. And I'm more than delighted to contribute to, to this debate as, uh, as I, I have to uh, declare, uh, presenting officer, uh, an interest here because um, I actually coached Kilmarnock Football Club, or was a coach of Kilmarnock Football Club, in the mid-90s uh, when Alex Totten uh, was the manager there. And there were some great names about at that time, uh, like uh, Bobby Williamson, uh, who went on uh, to manage the club to the great, uh, the great uh, cup, cup win in 1997, to the Gary Holtz, and, 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 and who was pivotal in that 1997 cup win, and, and Monty, who was there. And it's great to see him uh, still with a, a prominent role at the club. Uh, Paul Wright was, 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 was um, recently into the club at that time when he went on to, to score the goal that, that won the cup in the final. So getting to do a little bit, uh, little bit of that work with the team at the time uh, <coughs> was a real privilege. And I have to say, uh, when we're discussing you know, who, you're, who, who you support, I, I, I'm, my support for, for football clubs is fairly diluted, uh, Kilmarnock being one of them. Uh, but I moved, to, I, I moved to Kilmarnock to do a bit of coaching in Kilmarnock from air. And as Willie Coffey will, will uh, I testify to, and I, I discovered at the time, Rangers Celtic isn't the biggest <laughs> rivalry in Scottish football. There was, there was a point, I didn't recognise that at the time, and then walking down the street, in uh, 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 air, having moved to Kilmarnock, uh, I was reminded of that by several people walking, <laughs> coming down the street. So, um, and I have to say that uh, um, in, in recognising how fantastically well uh, Kilmarnock are doing this, this season and welcome the way that they're doing this season, I also think it's quite intriguing, intriguing to see that perhaps uh, in the not too distant future, that local rivalry uh, with Air United, uh, who are doing well in the division below, um, I, I think that would be that would be something that would that would uh, certainly enhance enhance the top uh, the top tier of football. Having when I, when I I infrequently I have to say go along to, to football matches, but if there's an Air Kelly game, that's a game that, that's a game you want to be at. And and uh, the last time that we I think it was the cup, uh, maybe happily take an intervention. Emma Harper. Intervention. He mentions Ayr and Killy and the um, rivalry between them, but there is another FIPBA team in the South West, Stranraer Football Club, in the home town of mine, where I used to go to the matches when I was wee. It celebrates its 150th anniversary next year, so I would just like him to comment on that as well. <laughs> Fine, yeah, let, let's get all our constituency football clubs as much as we, <laughs> as much as we possibly can. But I just need the. the, the uh, I mean, I, I'm going to go on to talk about the importance of, of uh, football clubs within, within the communities, but I think that, uh, I, I, Willie was probably there as well at that game, that, that when Ayr and Kilmarnock play each other, uh, at Rugby Park's full, uh, and I think, I think that, that those kind of rivalries are things that, uh, that, that really uh, galvanise and enhance our community. And, and to, to Emma Harper's point, I think what I wanted to say was that um, football clubs uh, are, generally speaking, very much the heart of the community, and I think Kilmarnock, uh, football club um, uh, uh, is a great extol of, of that, and I think they, uh, that's a model. I think others should uh, uh, should follow. They have the ability to, to galvanise a community, the ability to pull their community together. Um, in, in terms of what what the Kelly Trust are now doing, uh, the Football Supporters Club are, uh, 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 Trust are now doing uh, s some fantastic work in pulling that community in, 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 into Kilmarnock Football Club. And they have an all-weather pitch at Kilmarnock. And uh, you know, I, I went along a couple of summers ago to watch my daughter play in a netball tournament where they'd set out six, uh, six netball pitches on the Kilmarnock football pitch. And, and so that, that ability for, for the football club to, to, to reach out into the community and, 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 and bring them in, I think it cannot be underestimated. And that, of course, uh, applies across the, 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 um, uh, every other club. I had so much more to say, Deputy Presiding Officer, but can I just say, I hope that Kilmarnock Football Club will continue to have that influence in the local community, uh, and I think it is a model for others to follow. Uh, I congratulate them on reaching the milestone of 150 years, and doing so once again, I'd like to thank Willie Coffey for bringing this debate to the Chamber, and I wish Kilmarnock Football Club every success 
on and off the pitch going forward, Deputy Presiding Officer. Kenneth Gibson, followed by Colin Smith. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And as a fellow Ayrshire MSP, I congratulate Willie Coffey on securing this debate, celebrating the longevity and success of Kilmarnock Football Club, Scotland's oldest professional football club. And of course, Ayrshire is the heartland of junior football, and I have six junior football clubs in my own constituency. Uh, uh, Kelly, of course, have been uh, historically Ayrshire's top team, but after Rochin likes Talbot's performance at Beechwood Park last month against the United, um, of course, seeing a junior uh, team win against professional local rivals was momentous, memorable and really captured the spirit of what Scottish football is about. And I'm sure Kelly fans shed few tears watching long-standing rivals air get put in their place just two weeks after Kelly celebrated its 150th anniversary. That rivalry itself was over 100 years old, with the first match between the two sides held in September 1910, the same year that Air United were formed. It finished four each. Of course, Willie Coffey would argue that it was a dodgy penalty. It should have been given in the last minute, but sadly it wasn't. Kamalik's story has taken the club far beyond Ayrshire from its match against Renton in October 1873, the first ever match in the official Scottish Cup, to winning the trophy for the, for the first time, beating Albion Rovers and Hamden in 1920, with subsequent successes in 1929 and 1997. So like my own club, St Mirren, they have won the Scottish Cup on three occasions. And this Saturday, Kelly faced Rangers on home turf in the final 16, and I certainly wish them all the best. Kamara is enjoying a 26th consecutive season in Scotland's top flight and doing brilliantly under Steve Clark with modest resources. Kelly are one of those select band of clubs that have won all three domestic trophies, including the league title in 1965 and League Cup in 2012. And Kelly has enjoyed the international stage, first competing in Europe in the 1964-65 Intercities First Cup, where in their first tie, uh, they came from 4-0 down in aggregate, uh, as Willie Coffey has, uh, has told us, with some passion, uh, to score five goals and a, and a magnificent performance to defeat Eintracht Frankfurt 5-0. A year later uh, on aggregate, uh, sorry, 5-1 five, five on the night and 5-4 on aggregate. A year later, they held eventual winners of the European Cup that season, Real Madrid 2-1 at home, while in 66-67, they reached the first Cup semi-final. And indeed, if uh, Hibs had knocked out Leeds earlier, there had been three Scottish clubs in the quarter-finals of that competition that year. Kelly has played nine seasons in Europe and further afield, represented Scotland in the New York International Tournament, being runner-up in that 1960 competition. The club's home stadium, Rugby Park, has a history almost as illustrious as the team itself. First used in 1899 during the, during the Second World War, the army installed large oil storage tanks on the pitch. The club were never compensated for loss of their ground. But after the war, Italian prisoners of war helped extend the North Terrace. Major redevelopment took place in 94-95 and became the 17,889 capacity all-seater stadium we know today. In addition to home matches, Rugby Park was also the venue for two Scottish internationals and even an Elton John concert. The success of a club is not just measured on the pitch, of course. Kilmarnock FC's community outreach programmes have brought enormous benefit to the local community. In 2018 alone, Kilmarnock Community Sports Trust delivered 747 football hours to 719 primary children through its schools programme, supported 20 players playing twice a week at walking football, hosted an eight-team Central Scotland tournament at Rugby Park in September, provided 600 meals, football training and nutritional information to 60 young people in collaboration with TAC, Go Football and the Park Hotel, to name but a few achievements. Since its inception in 2015, the Trust has offered a wide variety of programmes to help develop young players and aspire to get active and involved in football, putting community at the heart of the organisation and offering children and young people opportunities otherwise close to them. I hope this aspect of the club's work will prove as long-lasting as the football itself, as it's making a huge difference to many lives. I read with interest Danny Garavelli's column in The Scotsman last weekend, Can Kilmarnock Football Success Revive, Revitalise the Town? In it, she's described how manager Steve Clark from Saltcoats, in my constituency, has transformed the team, taking them from bottom to near the top of the Scottish Premier League. This success has breathed new life into the club, with a Muffet stand closed last season due to lack of ticket sales reopened and morale high. The club's upward trajectory is almost in tandem with the fate of the town itself. Presenting officer, Scottish football is all about the fans and communities that support the club and the club that bolsters the community. 
I'm sure that regardless of their personal allegiances of members across the chamber, they will join me in saying that Kilmarnock FC makes an, makes an invaluable contribution to the social fabric of Ayrshire and Scotland as a whole. As much as football sometimes divides us, it's a power to unite us in victory and defeat, in seeing the underdog win the day and in watching heroes triumph. I congratulate Kilmarnock FC on their success over the last 150 years and look forward to, to see them going on to even greater heights. Colin Smith, followed by John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. It's a, a privilege to join with other members in celebrating Kilmarnock Football Club's 150th anniversary, and I thank Willie Coffey for securing today's debate. Well, so we might not break up into a joint chorus of, of paper roses at a time of debates on Brexit and budgets with a fair share of disagreements. It's good to be taking part in a debate with such refreshing, unanimous cross-party support. I was asked at the weekend by a constituent what I'd be speaking on uh, in the chamber this week and explained the, the various debates and, and, and statements, and, including this one. He said to me, why are you talking about Kilmarnock Football Club? So I said to him, well, this is roughly what I'm going to say. See what you think. I said, Kilmarnock Football Club isn't just any football club. It's Scotland's oldest professional club celebrating its 150th anniversary. A club who were the, one of the first teams to take part in Association Football's second oldest tournament, the Scottish Cup, back in 1873. A tournament they won in 1920, followed by a second success in 1929, when they beat Rangers 2-0 in front of over 114,000 people at Hamden Park, before completing a hat-trick of Scottish Cup wins in 1997. In 1965, Willie Waddle led Kelly to the then top-tier First Division Championship. And just seven years ago, the club defied the pundits by winning the League Cup against Celtic. And maybe most importantly of all, Kilmarnock have won the Ayrshire Cup 42 times. Now that's not to say there haven't been lean times. I remember in the 1980s watching Kelly play in Division 2, but I have a confession to make. I was there cheering on my local team, Queen of the South, as a Dunhamer, who celebrate, uh, I have to say, a centenary this year. But it's 26 years now since Tommy Burns led Kilmarnock back into football's top flight, where they've stayed ever since. And now they sit proudly near the top, even flirting with the top spot recently under Stevie Clark's leadership, all despite having a budget a fraction of the size of the old firm. There really is a buzz about the club today, and crowds are growing as more and more people head to Rugby Park on a Saturday. Bill Shankly once said, football without fans is nothing. And presiding officer, it's the Kelly fans, a growing number, who are at the very heart of Kilmarnock Football Club as they celebrate their 150th anniversary. Not least, of course, through the establishment recently of the Kelly Trust in 2003 to bring supporters closer to the club. In 2017, they launched the Trust and Kelly Initiative and supporters from around the world pledged a remarkable £100,000 to buy unallocated shares in Kelly and put a supporter on the board of the club as a full and equal director. In May last year, that new director was appointed, giving fans a voice at the club's decision-making table. That director, of course, will be familiar to many members in this parliament. It is, of course, Cathy Jameson, the former member of the Scottish Parliament for Carrick, Cumnock and Doon Valley, and former member of parliament for Kilmarnock and Loudoun. Cathy is already making a, a huge impact, leading the way in improving communication between the club and fans, and working with other directors, Billy Bowie and Phyllis McLeish, to develop Kilmarnock as a real, true community club. The Kelly Trust itself are building on the success of the, the Trust and Kelly campaign, generating more funds for the club, looking at how those funds can be invested for the benefit of fans. Kilmarnock FC are setting an example across football, where fans don't just follow their club, they lead the club, so fitting as supporters celebrate the 150 proud years. President officer, I began my comments by saying a constituent asked me why I was talking about Kilmarnock FC in Parliament, and I've just told the Chamber roughly what I said to him. You're probably wondering what his reply was. Well, unfortunately, he said, well, I still don't understand why you're debating Kilmarnock Football Club. I have to tell you, it was an advice surgery in Ayr where I made those comments, and he did confess he was an Ayr United fan. President officer, congratulations to the players, directors, staff and supporters of Kilmarnock Football Club in your 150th year. Thank you. John Finney, followed by George Adam. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And can I, on behalf of the Scottish Green Party, congratulate Kilmarnock Football Club, uh, our nation's oldest professional club, on, on this significant milestone, and thank Willie Coffey for uh, bringing this motion here. Now, Willie said at the outset he would like to, if I no, I'd like to hear which club you support. Well, for the avoidance of any doubt, I refer people to my register of interests and my many associations with Heart of Lothian Football Club which inevitably leads me to talk about something that uh, Willie's already alluded to, uh, season 1964-65. Goals average, the one and only time it happened. I think it must have been devised by Stuart Stevenson. It's quite a mathematical uh, 
uh, set up. Um, uh, goal score divided by goals conceded, and Kilmarnock had to win 2-0. Two no, two no. uh, winning 3-1 or 4-2 wouldn't have done it. Now, I'll not go into the figures, uh, um, but um, 38,000 people were there to see it. Uh, I wasn't one of them. Um, and Of course. Kenneth Gibson. What's upsetting is that the fact that if goal average had been used in 1986, Hearts would have won the title that year, the loss to Dundee on the last game. And if goal difference had been used in 1965, they'd have won the title that year. So they'd have switched the, the actual system around. Hearts would now have two more league titles than, than it currently has. <laughs> John Finney, can I say I'm at a complete loss here, so I'm just yeah, going to have yeah. to explain this up to me later. John Finney. Well, well, well President <laughs> Officer, if I can help, the intervention from the member was not meant to be of a therapeutic nature, let me put it that way. <laughs> um, uh, if I had issues before about such matters, I'll certainly have to reflect them now. But point nothing for of a goal, point nothing for of a goal. Now, I was actually going to come on to say that, that, that people say time's a healer. Uh, well, 86 in Dens Park would certainly prove that not to be the <laughs> prove that not to be the case but there's good news from 64 65 because i'm delighted that the member took an intervention from um, bruce crawford there dunfermline did end up three hey, the good news is the gruesome twosome were nowhere to be seen they were away down the league that one friends and influence people um, because I, I have to say i don't think our national sport is helped by the duopoly uh, um, and, and i i would say uh, that uh, there's a significant comra camaraderie among fans out with that and that's healthy uh, now um, i often get asked how does a native of Lochaber, born and bred in the highlands come to support the hearts um, and get chided for not supporting my local team i do support my local team my local team is Lochaber camera um, uh, from Spainbridge and scotland's other national sport shinty but of course i'm very keen to to lend support to both inverness caledonia and thistle and ross county and hope they'll do well uh, my, my father uh, was a Hearts fan, and the generation on generation thing is, is very important. My grandson now being a, well, primarily a Barcelona and a Hearts fan. And identity with the club, and the club, the, the identity with the club with the community and vice versa is very important. Um, now, I fondly recall Kilmarnock's uh, win in 1997, um, and uh, fondly recall the celebrations and the wonderfully named John Finney Street. I mean, that's uh, the bus top celebrations there. And again, again, 2012 and the emotion that's been alluded to and won't dwell on but the mixed emotions and the sadness associated with that now, i've enjoyed my visits to rugby park some good games certainly good pies um, and as has been said command have been a breath of fresh air of of, of late and and and, and uh, i would uh, uh, there was reflections on eintracht frankfurt that's a, a famous name and that's a very famous game that was alluded to there and i'm sure many would like to see the the european knights back at uh, uh, at rugby park i know that non-football fans and i might be surrounded with them in this part of the chamber have no comprehension of of issues of the nuances but it, it is it is it's a it's a wonderful game it's a wonderful way of bringing people together and the dark days endured these cold wet days and the glory nights savored in the hope of repeating i was 42 years of age before i had a glory day in 1998 uh, um, now Kilmarnock have a, a proud and a, a, con a contribution that they've made to Scottish football and that's continuing with their beautiful game and I want to see them enjoy a long and healthy future entertaining the rest of us and at the end of the day what's point nothing for of a, a goal between friends thank you uh, the last two contributions in the open debate George Adam followed by Graham Simpson Thank you, President Officer, and can I thank Willie Coffey for bringing this debate to the Parliament and congratulate Kilmarnock FC on their 150th anniversary. I was just noting there that I can't believe I wore a blue suit on the day we're having this debate, you know, because they normally it would be black and white being my colours and part of the reason is, I've maybe not mentioned this before, President Officer, but I'm a St Munn supporter and in 2017, <laughs> We were 140 years old and we will probably join uh, Kelly in eight years' time as uh, 150 years old. And I think one of the big things about this debate has the importance of football to our nation. Not only is it our national sport, but these clubs are the heart and soul of many of the communities that we live in. I think as politicians, 
we should actually look at that and embrace that a wee bit more than what we currently do because I think they could maybe help us in many of the things that we are currently looking at in this place and we should maybe embrace them on that side of things as well. But you might be surprised, uh, uh, presiding officer, that I actually do some research for some of these speeches. And while I was doing research, I found out that Kilmarnock in 1887 to 1890, their strip was black and white stripes with uh, black uh, shorts and black socks. Now, that sounds like a perfect colour scheme that they should have kept as time went on. At the same time, St Mon were wearing a black and white strip that had blue, ironically, uh, shorts and blue socks. And when you look at it, there's many things that connect St Mon and Kilmarnock. Not so much the fact that uh, when Morton and Ayr aren't in the same division, it's our nerdy game, it's our derby game. Uh, that we get because it's just a quick drive down the road and at this point I'd like to apologise to Willie Coffey for uh, various uh, Adam family soirees in Kilmarnock at Nerdy where the New Year's uh, kind of the parties have continued. You know, uh, you might have started your club in the Temperance Hotel in Kilmarnock, that's a foreign word to some of my family members in the past. But when you look at how St Murn and Kilmarnock have actually played with each other, Killy are winning at the moment, 87 to 84 at St Murn. So it's roughly about 50-50 really, you know, isn't it? But there's a connection with the fact that the current manager, Stevie Clark, has actually started his career at St Murn Football Club before going on to Chelsea. Yes, I will do it. Brian Whittle. Uh, thank, 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 thank you for taking the mention. We also recognise the connection between Kilmarnock and St Murn and they have the same sprint coach over a period of time there as well. Yes, I was, rather, dis I was rather disappointed that you bragged about the time that you worked, Mr Whittle, uh, in uh, Ayrshire, and you didn't talk about the time when you degraded up to the mighty St Murn, you know, <laughs> and you became the sprint coach for them. But uh, the clubs have actually both, as already been said, won the Scottish Cup uh, three times and the League Cup once. And although Kilmarnock are Scotland's oldest professional club, they're not a founder member of the Scottish Football League, because unlike St Murn, you know, on the 30th of April 1890, there were two clubs in Paisley, Abercorn being one of which my great-great-grandfather actually played centre-half for them. And uh, along the other clubs that were there that are still in uh, business currently were St Murn, Dumbarton, uh, Hearts and Celtic. You know, and there are a few others from uh, that season that are no longer with us. But Kilmarnock were founder members of something called the Scottish Football Alliance, which later, uh, which seems quite strange, and Ayr, which became Ayr United, and Morton were part of that early league as well before they all ended up in the Scottish divisions. So I think when we look at history uh, of football, it's quite fascinating when you look at it because uh, basically, as Willie Coffey already mentioned, Football and rugby, at the very beginning of the clubs, there were actually no, the rules weren't there. And some games that we would look at now, we would think they were rugby games. You know, both our clubs started as uh, what you'd probably recognise as a rugby club, hence the reason Kilmarnock still call their ground Rugby Park. And uh, when you look at it now, that we've since 1877, St Murn have been playing football, but were in 1876 originally a football team as well. Uh, I was looking at some of the things that actually came up in the same year that uh, Kilmarnock were uh, formed. Ulysses S. Grant was sworn in as the president of uh, the United States and University of Oxford won the very first boat race. So it shows you everything else that was happening in the world while we were just kicking a ball about a full field. You know, but uh, the, when you look at the, the history of football, uh, you've got to remember there's other people involved in our great game as well. And another Kilmarnock boy was Hugh McIlvanny, who recently left us all. He did his apprenticeship as a journalist in uh, the Kilmarnock Standard. And he once said of United, uh, Newcastle United in his typical kind of wit, people talk of Newcastle United as a sleeping giant. They last won the championship in 1927 and the FA Cup in 1955. They, are al they already make Rip Van Winkle look like a catnapper. So, presiding officer, perhaps since both of our teams, Willie Coffey and I, have actually won a tournament a lot sooner than the Newcastle United, perhaps our teams are currently just having a catnap and the glory days are just beyond the horizon. Graham Simpson. Thanks, presiding officer. Can I also congratulate uh, Willie Coffey for... Um, uh, having this debate, um, I was looking at his motion, and it was one, one of the longest motions I've ever read, actually. It seemed to be the en entire history of Kilmarnock FC. Uh, certainly, uh, all the high points were in there. We almost don't need to 
have the debate, uh, but I'm glad we have because we've discovered uh, that Brian Whittle is both a Kilmarnock and St. Mirren reject. Um, now, I'm not uh, a Killy fan. <laughs> I'm not a Killy fan. Um, I'm a Celtic fan. Uh, but I do have a soft spot for Kilmarnock. Uh, Mrs. Simpson also has a soft spot for them uh, because Kilmarnock is the only away ground uh, she's ever been to in Scotland. And uh, I know how to treat her. And it's there we both discovered uh, and fell in love with the Killy pie. Uh, it was a cold uh, Sunday morning and it tasted absolutely fantastic. Presiding officer, uh, there's only one special one in football in my eyes. Uh, and it's not the former Chelsea and Man United manager. Now, it used to be uh, very easy in those days for old firm fans to get tickets uh, to go to Kilmarnock. You could just phone them up or you could just turn up um, and, you could, and you could get in. Uh, Motherwell were in the same boat. Uh, sadly, uh, those days are, are gone, so it's much more difficult for people like me to go to grounds like Kilmarnock, and that's a shame. It was a very open and welcoming club. I remember one of Killy's many managers, uh, Bobby Williamson. Um, he also encouraged uh, easy access. He would allow um, calls, phone calls from fans. He would take phone calls from fans to explain tactics and team selection, etc. cetera. Um, it was a bit of a character, was Williamson. Uh, while he was Hibbs manager, his silver Mercedes uh, was clocked doing 107 miles per hour on the M74 near Lockerbie. He was found guilty of speeding and banned for three months. Uh, but his fame as a soccer boss sadly did not extend to Constable Jane Monteith. She said after the car was flag flagged down, Williamson was invited into the back of the police car and asked to give his details, and she told the court he was polite initially, but then said we should really appreciate who he was and could, set, could we settle the matter at the side of the road? He kept saying we should know who he was, but I didn't know who he was. And in, in 150 years, you do go through a few gaffers. There have been Tommy Burns, who left for Celtic, Alex Totten, Jim Jeffries, Kenny Shields, and right up to the present day, Steve Clark. Uh, now, I do like Steve Clark. He impresses me, and he amuses me at the same time. I think under that dour exterior, there's a bit of a comedian uh, somewhere. But he's doing a fantastic job. And if they can finish second this season, I will be delighted. <laughs> Collect Kilmarnock collected more points over the course of 2018 than any other team in the Premiership. Great, great stuff. Um, St Steve has given the players back their self-belief, says Sandy Armour, who's the editor of the club fanzine, the Killy Hippo. Why is it called the hippo? I've absolutely no idea, but it sounds funny. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe somebody knows. No. <laughs> Killy fans have plenty to be cheerful about as they celebrate their 150th anniversary and notch up a few more victories over Rangers, especially this Saturday, and we can all be very happy. Uh, now, I was reading, like Kenny Gibson at the weekend, how the team's current success is giving a feel-good factor to the town, and that's fantastic because when I worked in newspapers, it seemed all you ever read about Kilmarnock was a story about this, the scheme star, or that, the scheme star. Uh, Marvin's new teeth, paid for by the Scottish Sun, stood out as particularly ridiculous. Um, Onthank has never, in my view, been representative of Kilmarnock. The feel-good factor uh, has even seen a boost for the hard luck tattoo shop, uh, which may now have to change its name. So Achilles' first 150 years has been up and down. Let's hope the next 150 can see them continuing on their current upward trajectory, just so long as they're not too successful. Uh, before I call the minister, I've realized that if we really, if we really, really wish to hear from him, uh, we'll need to extend the debate for up to half an hour under Rule 8.14.3. Um, I now invite Willie Coffey to move a motion without notice. Could I move that motion, please, Mr. Officer? Thank you. The question is that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we all agreed? We are. That is agreed. And I now call the Minister for around seven minutes, please, Mr Day. 
Indeed, President Officer, I'm not going to take half an hour. Um, uh, let me begin by uh, congratulating Willie Coffey, not just for securing this debate, uh, but for what was a smashing speech and, and one of a number that we've heard. Uh, as a supporter of a Scottish club that's only been around for 116 years, let me acknowledge the achievement of Kilmarnock reaching its 150th anniversary and, and marking that by enjoying a season to remember. Albeit as an Aberdeen fan, I do hope the season ends with the Dons being ahead of Kelly as they currently are. Presiding officer, football is Scotland's national game. It's in our DNA. It can be a source of great banter. The fortunes of our clubs can have a major impact on our weekend. On and off field activity dominates uh, media and social media and discussion in communities. Indeed, presiding officer, it has on occasion been known to feature in Facebook interaction between myself and Mr. Coffey. And on the subject of the friendly rivalry and banter that John Finney referenced, it was great to hear substantial contributions today from supporters of St Mirren, Hearts, Queen of the South and Celtic. But I do have to say that the passing mentions secured for Albion Rovers, Dunfermline and Stranra bordered on the shameless. I, I also noted Brian Whittle's diplomatic contribution describing his loyalties as diluted and Kenny Gibson getting through four minutes without showing his hand. Um, Scottish football playing officer has its challenges and we are working with clubs, the football authorities and other stakeholders to address these. But it remains a hugely important and generally positive influence on the day-to-day -day lives of Scots. Whilst our men's national team may not be as successful as once it was, and our club sides are no longer feared across Europe. Scotland's women uh, have reached the Euros two years ago, and this year will contest the World Cup finals. A, a remarkable achievement. And domestically, our game remains strong. With a top flight that sees just 11 points covering the top four sides, and the championship even more keenly contested, there is a competitiveness afoot which can only be good for the sport. Attendances remain high, the highest per capita in Europe, and interest is as powerful as ever. So there's much to celebrate, much to discuss, as we've heard that, and we've heard that reflected in contributions from members this afternoon. Uh, as I noted earlier, and others have, that this debate to mark the 150th anniversary of Kilmarnock FC could not be better timed, given the fantastic progress which has been achieved under the leadership of Steve Clark. The club, despite relatively modest resources, is performing magnificently near the top of the table and is currently involved in an exciting tussle for the title. It's been a thrilling season so far and I do hope Kelly continue to keep up this pace for the remainder of the campaign. However, presiding officer, as a government minister, I'm of course required to not knowingly mislead parliament. Therefore, let me say that my personal hope is pretty much the same as Graham Simpson's and that's to see Kelly finish runners up in the league, albeit behind Aberdeen. However unlikely that scenario might be, especially after last night. To be serious though, presiding officer, let's recognise, as others have, the history and the standing of the rugby park side within the Scottish game. It is the oldest professional football club in Scotland, one of the founding members of the SFA, and it took part in what was thought to have been the first ever Scottish Cup fixture in 1873. Uh, I was half expecting Stuart Stephen to be in the chamber to tell us that he had a relative taking part in that game or, or claiming to have been there. Um, the club joined the Scottish League in 1895 and was elected to the top flight for the first time in 1899. In 1920, as Willie Coffey uh, observed, Kilmarnock won the Scottish Cup and that was followed soon by a second success in 1929 when Rangers were mem uh, memorably beaten at Hamden in front of a, a 114,708 strong uh, crowd, as Colin Smith noted. The club, of course, won the Scottish Cup for a third time in 1997, and its most recent honour was the League Cup when Celtic were defeated in 2012. However, and with apologies to John Finney, because I don't want to intrude, intrude particularly on his personal grief, the greatest moment in Kelly's history was, of course, when the club won the top flight title in 1964-65. It was, as we've heard, a dramatic title race with hearts three points clear in the days of two points for a win with two games remaining. The clubs went head-to-head -head on that final day of the season and Kilmarnock won 2-0 to claim the championship. The club, as again we've heard, has also made its mark in Europe, qualifying for European competition on nine occasions in its finest hour, being reached in the semi-finals of the 66-67 Fierce Cup, only to be defeated by Leeds United. Uh, 
Kelly uh, are, of course, one of only a few Scottish clubs to have played in all three uh, European competitions. Now, as, as others have noted, like all SPFL clubs and many other football sides in Scotland, Kilmarnock is associated with a trust which fulfills an important community role. The Scottish Government greatly values the work undertaken in communities using the power of football to inspire the delivery of wider outcomes. That, uh, this work is the main focus of our engagement with football through individual organisations as well as representatives of national bodies like the SPFL Trust and the Scottish FA. Established in 2015, the Kilmarnock Community Sports Trust is a charitable organisation which aims to support the local community. Working with local people from the age of three and upwards, the Trust offers a wide variety of programmes to assist in developing younger players and help them aspire to get active and involved in football. Presiding officer, in conclusion. John Finney. Mention and, and would absolutely concur with his comments about trusts. I wonder if he, he would uh, agree with me that fan ownership is a way of building in that and building the community further uh, closer to the club. Graham Day. I absolutely agree with that point. I, I, I think the more that fans are involved in the running of their football clubs, uh, the better. Uh, as I said, President Officer, to conclude, um, let me congratulate Mr Coffey again on securing this debate. And of course, I'd like to congratulate Kilmarnock on its 150th anniversary and wish it almost every success on and off the field in this historic season. President Officer. That concludes the debate on congratulations to Kilmarnock Football Club on its 150th anniversary and the meeting is adjourned until half past two. <laughs>